actually start by asking you very initially, literally at the start, and of course pollution, as you know, is the topic, and everyone is just talking about air pollution. I don't think we've ever debated or discussed it as much as we've done it this year. It's very interesting because this is going on from 1999. It's 2017 now. And you say this, and I quote, often we're so lost in the problem that we lose our ability to propose what should be done. And the solution is right there, you say. Tell me, talk us through a bit about that. Why is that? Are we, as far as, especially because pollution, everybody wants a solution. Where are we lost? But one of the things that we have done consistently is that we have not just told people the problem, but we have explained the solution. So in 1999, when air pollution was you know, in our faces, just as it was the last 15 days ago, we talked about what to do. And that's when we came up with the idea of what about CNG. And we did that because at that stage, you had the beginning of the science of what we today understand is small particulates. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was writing this, it sounds so bizarre that today you're explaining what PM 2.5 is. I mean, every media, everybody today is PM 2.5. And yet, as Anumita will tell you, you know, when we were doing this in 1999, what is PM? And then first it was PM10, and then it became 2.5. And of course, as I start off with this affidavit from one of the companies, which was, I deny, I deny, I deny, because at that stage, the science was so unclear. Mm. But I think the most important thing for us has been to stay always to say, OK, there is a problem. But what do we do about it? And I think that has definitely given us some amount of confidence that we should be able to find answers for the future as well. But, you know, interestingly, in the book, you call air pollution a great equalizer. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you say there is rich environmentalism and there is poor environmentalism. Mm -hmm. Contradictory? Contradictory to some extent. But that's where I think air pollution is different, mm -hmm. OK? Um, air pollution is a great equalizer. I mean, this winter, all of us have been uh, really worried about air pollution. I think two things have happened. One, the knowledge of uh, the impact on health has become clear. Two, we have come to realize that uh, uh, air is common, that we can put up our air purifiers at home, but we will not, we, that can't save us. And that's different from, say, water water pollution because in water pollution all of us have um, a water treatment system at home a private water treatment system you know the fact that Yamuna is the mess it is today is really an academic issue it makes a few makes us feel bad and you know emotional but we really don't it doesn't bother us air pollution bothers us and I think it is an equalizer because at the end of the day um, if we don't get energy to large numbers of poor women in this country who cook on biomass, you'll never fix the air of your cities. But as I acknowledge in the book, I don't think we have been as successful as we should have been because I'm not sure which form of environmentalism is growing in India. Is it the environmentalism of the middle class, which is not in my backyard, but it can be in the backyard of the poor? Or is it the environmentalism of the poor, which will be rights for all? But there is also that sense of that, you know, in the Western world, everyone cares about environment because they don't have to uh, worry about their uh, daily khana or, mm. you know, their mm. daily uh, this thing. Mm. So in that sense, is environment always going to take a back seat because the vote bank will always be something different? It'll be the Bijli Sarak Pani? You know, I think that's a very, you know, I, in my view, that's actually a wrong notion of what's happening because mm -hmm. the poor in this country are more environmentally conscious than the rich in this country. Um, the rich are resource illiterate. The poor um, use the environment intensively because they have no other alternative. But I think that's really the notion of environmentalism that we have got from the West, which is actually a very flawed notion because if you if you had it, things fixed there you wouldn't have climate change today if you were the environment minister of india i hope never if you were the environment minister of india 
tell me five things that you would do. Well, I mean, first, definitely clean up the air of Delhi. I wouldn't be a minister who would not clean up. Two, I think the biggest issue is going to be get people off cars, uh, but in a way that is convenient to commute. Yeah, because which last mile connectivity is a huge, huge issue. issue, which yeah. means get all your buses, most convenient, most modern buses, metro, cycle lanes. You need the right to walk. If you can't cross a street, you can't take a metro. And you yourself have faced that awful cycle accident. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I had remarkable doctors who saved me. The third is to make sure that we can get much better governance. I mean, your basic problem with air pollution today is that there's very little attention to detail. In every part of our lives, when it's affecting us, why do you think the Indian is not responding? And I'm not talking just about the politicians. I'm really talking about the Aadmi. We've abdicated our responsibility. We've kind of given it to what we believe is the state which is going to handle it. And I think that's where our biggest weakness is. I mean, as I say, in, you know, one of the things you asked me, Monica, earlier, and you know, this whole issue about the environmentalism. And I think the future, as I see, is as the poor of India get more empowered, then the environmentalism of the rich will get fixed. In the fight, who's a tougher opponent, the corporate or the politician? You know, corporates are actually, um, um, I'm sure many of them. Mm. Um, <laughs> corporates are not very competent. Mm. I mean, um, my colleagues are far more competent. Okay, because they speak from, um, I mean, for them it's all from inside. They care about it. And if I was to point out one biggest enemy we have, the one that I, we have found hardest to defeat is the mind. Okay? Not the politician? Not the politician. Uh -huh. I actually find politicians wonderful. Mm. I don't have a problem with I'm going to open the floor for original new questions for Sunita. People or the population that's going to really face their hardship are not us in this room. It is the children and the youngsters. So is there a way of energizing the youngsters, schools, colleges, young parents whose babies would be 80 years old towards the end of the century? So can there be a comprehensive approach, a strategy, independent of the government, that we can build a, a, yeah. a momentum among the young, young Indians? Sunita? I think, um, Amitabh, a lot can be done and we're all of us chipping away at that. It's very clear. You're absolutely right. It is going to be that generation uh, which needs to make sure that they are different. Um, um, and many schools in, in India are today doing this and working. We ourselves have at CSE a green schools program. We now have a university reader because we want to, our whole approach is to build multipliers. So yes, I think, you know, uh, we need to build that very strong consciousness across and we need to be able to show people that there is a way ahead. I think that to me is the most important thing. China has realized today it's the worst polluter as far as the greenhouse gas is concerned. <coughs> but even it's realized that the healthcare impact of what it's doing is tremendous. So even when you talk about Petco, they got severe, you know, uh, uh, rules in place now. Uh, your book is Conflicts of Interest. So when will it become in our interest uh, for our industry and perhaps the government to actually say that we need to, you know, uh, curb and uh, plant down? And Beijing is much better than India now. No, it's much better, but they've taken hard action. Yeah, it's not yeah. been sort of soft here and there. It's been, they've actually got rid of large coal. They've got rid of uh, all the dirty fuels, and they've made sure they still have a problem with vehicles, as Anumita will tell you. But they still, but they're working at it. And I think, you know, Siddharth, actually, when he was at NDTV, we did a raid at, um, at the, the, that story that was also taken yeah. up by NGT. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And 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 so that the matter still continues. So I mean, I think we need. Yeah. And what appalls me is that even today, two companies have gone to Supreme Court asking for the ban to be lifted. So you know, it's this is why when I wrote this, so what comes out is it requires us not to give up, however much we may want to. Because it's going to, I don't know what that interests, our interests are going to be because the other problem has always been that we tend to make it somebody else's problem. 
It is in our interest to get clean air, but I don't want to do anything to change my lifestyle to get that clean air. Okay? It's somebody else's problem. So when we talk about diesel cars, it's 1% of the problem. You talk about diesel generators, it's another 1%. You talk about everything is only 1% and it's not mine. Pet coke is 1%. So I think we need to be able to understand there is going to be a price to be paid and that we are going to have to take some tough decisions to move ahead. If nothing, then what this um, uh, last episode has shown us in Delhi is that we are doing too little too late. There's the point where you said that the woman who is using biomass and we need to grow uh, because there are poor people out there who will need access to energy. And I'm just wondering, as environmentalists, have we questioned enough our concept of growth? Because we keep saying we need to pollute because we need to grow. And I know that that's a tension which is uh, at you know, the UNFCCC, this is discussed enough. But uh, have we internally challenged this concept of growth as politicians or as developing countries know it? Are we willing to... To give up growth? Yes, and you know, is it growth versus and environment? Does it definitely mean turning left, or is no. there a concept of growth of degrowth? Or Bahar, you and I have had this conversation many times, but I don't believe that you can ever tell a society degrowth is the option. I think what you have to tell a society is an alternative in which their livability goes up, but it would be a different way to move. So, for instance, let's take the example you gave. I mean. Uh, take air pollution. I mean, the fact is, two things are clear. You will need to do something on energy use, that, and that is important, and you can't, um, it means energy for all. Now, it does mean that you need to produce, if you don't want coal, then gas or renewable, but you need energy for all, okay? Uh, the only place that you will be able to argue with people that you will have to have limits on growth is when it is to do with uh, a better way.